So, hello. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Futures stage at FutureFest 2018. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and today I'm joined by Jamie Bartlett. Now, Virtual Futures, for those of you who don't know, first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s, and it rose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, us is most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it. It's actual aim hidden behind the brush deal, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What virtual futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. Discussions like this continue the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Today, I'm joined by Jamie Bartlett, whose new book, The People vs. Tech, uh, explores why democracy might be at stake. And, and Jamie, what was the reason for writing this book? Because this one came out very quickly after your, after your last book, and there was an urgent reason why this book needed to be written. Yeah, well, partly it was the publishers saying, you've got to write <laughs> this book really quickly because it's really topical, obviously. I mean, uh -huh. I'm not going to lie about that. And actually, I'd been writing it for quite some months, uh, and some of it was based on a TV series I did uh, called The Secrets of Silicon Valley, where I was uh, looking actually at Cambridge Analytica and automation and a few other big, big trends coming out of Silicon Valley. And the launch date was actually going to be, I think, late April or June. And then all that Cambridge Analytica stuff started coming back out again. Do you remember there was that week where everyone went Cambridge Analytica mad? It was in the news every single day. And my publishers were like, we have to get this book out really quickly. So we pulled the release date forward. So that's the, that's the boring technical stuff. I guess the bigger picture is yep. for several years, we see little isolated stories of Russian hacking, of cryptocurrencies being hard to trace, of internet trolling, of cybercrime that we can't solve. And they're treated as isolated stories. And I just thought there's a bigger thing going on here, which is essentially two tectonic plates that are rubbing up against each other digital technology and old school analog representative democracy. And it was just clear that the two are just constantly basically at war with each other. They don't work well together. And unfortunately, I think that that's only going to get worse and there probably can only be one winner in the end. So I felt like it was very important and urgent to put that out now. It's kind of interesting that in the last two or three months, some of the things that I thought were going to be quite controversial in that book are already sort of common knowledge now. It seemed pretty obvious about you know, the dangers to elections of interference from foreign governments. Well, do you still believe in democracy in an age of behavioral modification empires, in the age of social media? That can democracy still survive? It's not about... De you, you could still have all the trappings of democracy. You could still have plebiscites and elections and elected representatives. But if you don't have people that believe they are capable of making informed moral judgments that are capable of compromising with each other, that are capable of exercising patience when it comes to difficult long-term problems, um, people who believe that the electoral system actually functions and works, then you, it looks like a democracy, but it doesn't really get things done and people begin to lose faith in it. And the other one you haven't mentioned is smart machines. Read a lot of books about smart machines. They're coming out all the time. Max Tegmark, Nick Bostrom, constantly about AI and what's going to happen. None of them really talk about what sort of political system will we have in an age of genuinely smart machines? Because I don't think anyone's got a clue. And I'm not convinced that it would be a democracy. The hardline libertarians are delighted. They'll say, yeah, great. I post on Facebook sometimes. I very rarely go on Facebook for reasons that you might guess from the title of my book. Yeah. Uh, about about this and the libertarians you know say democracy is really under threat and they're like yeah great let's hope we smash it to pieces well a large a large bunch of those individuals that you've just mentioned want to turn their mps into machines they want to digitize democracy and and run it autonomously almost do you think that potentially could be a solution 
I think we've got to start thinking about the role of machines and AI a bit different. Not that it's going to be rubbish and it's not going to work and machines can never take complicated decisions. And, you know, I just bought a pair of sunglasses and now Amazon's trying to sell me another pair of sunglasses. That is terrible AI. Don't think about it like that. Think about what if it's, what if it's as good as people say? What if machines are capable of making complex moral judgments? What if you're going to be able to go to Alexa? Alexa, hello, Alexa. Please, would you tell me who to vote for in the next election? Please, would you tell me what I should vote in the next referendum? And maybe Alexa would know better than you. Not next year, but in 20 years, because we are generally quite rubbish at making decisions about our own interests. And who owns the smart machines may genuinely be able to make more efficient, Better, idea, better decisions in relation to economic growth. And then we will increasingly lean on those machines. And would you still call that a democracy? And you think it sounds ridiculous, but I, when I was at Demos, I'm still at Demos, was involved in building a voter app. One of these ones where you put numbers and data into an app saying what you think about in terms of politics. And the app spits out a party that it says that you should vote for. And millions of people have used that. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. I was like, it's amazing. It's going to engage people in politics. And now I think it's a terrible idea. We <sighs> should ditch them all because all we're really doing is outsourcing our own decision making to a machine that we don't really understand. So flip it and stop thinking about they're not really that good, these machines. They're rubbish. But think, well, in 25 years, maybe they will be brilliant. And what does that mean? And that's a bigger worry for me. But could it go one step further? So you're not just asking Alexa who to vote for. You can actually vote for Alexa. <laughs> um, I can't see that happening in the immediate future. Um, but in the end, what would be the difference, really, if you're asking Alexa who you should vote for and Alexa tells you and or you vote for Alexa and Alexa would be kind of trying to crowdsource decision making and... I don't know, <laughs> is the answer to that. But think about the power that would go to a personal assistant, whatever, it doesn't need to be Alexa. Simply of asking the question first, Alexa, buy me some milk. And you're like, well, what milk? And Alexa will make you go to Whole Foods because Amazon Sorry, owns Amazon. Whole Foods or whatever. Just the economic power that non-precise queries give to the people that run the platform. Similarly, it will go from that to tell me the news. Well, what news? From whom? And how do we know? These are, I think, really quite important questions. And if you think back to Jeremy Bentham and his philosophic calculus, i.e. let's build an alg proto-algorithm in the, in the 1700s to help policymakers always make the best decisions for maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering, sounded quite ludicrous. But I think philosophic calculus is, is possible is actually going to be possible. And we, I call this the moral singularity. You know, your good friend Ray Kurzweil talks about the technological singularity, where we have technology that just keeps improving itself so quickly that we basically, smart machines build smarter versions of themselves, which he says will happen in 2045, and he works for Google. Um, moral singularity is when we start outsourcing more moral judgments to machines or nudges, and we're happy to take that because they're smarter than us. And then we just lose the ability to do it. And that, to me, is going to happen before 2045 and something that's a, a bigger worry. Well, there is a small advantage here to democracy being under threat. And it's, it's very similar to the advantage that you spoke about in radicals, which is when democracy is under threat, suddenly we start giving a damn. Suddenly yeah. we start caring about it. So is there yeah. maybe a small advantage to the fact that suddenly Cambridge Analytica and all of these things that are happening are bringing this to the forefront of our consciousness. Oh, yeah, great. Cambridge Analytica has done more for the cause of internet privacy yeah. than every think tank report I ever wrote multiplied by 100. And it's true. It's through these crises that you respond. And so thanks, Cambridge Analytica. Alexander <laughs> Nix, if you're watching, appreciate what you've done for us. Um, yes, 100% agree with that. It's a, but it's a very horrible position to be in. We're just doing a debate upstairs about um, the problem with politics at the moment. And, and unfortunately, we talk a lot about educating people, getting people involved in politics and interested in politics. The only thing that I think is going to turn people's interest in politics around is when we have loads of massive crises piling up one on top of each other, and then suddenly everyone will get politicised. 
and then we'll solve a few problems, voter turnout will go up to 80%, things will get better again, and it will start sliding. So, but the question then is, what are the signs of the crisis? And how do you, at the time of crisis, react? Like, what do you do in response? And this book is partly a sort of suggestion that we're entering into a big crisis and it's time to react and respond. Well, the, the book also talks about how do we expedite that crisis to a degree, because one of the solutions that you come up with in the book is this idea of crypto anarchy. That could be the thing that is really interesting to solve some of these issues. What is your interest in the crypto anarchists? Well, the crypto anarchists, you actually, if anyone was at Vinay Gupta's talk just then, he's a bit of a crypto anarchist. The crazy thing about Vinay's talk upstairs is it was behind a massive green triangle. There was something very Illuminati oh, about God. Vinay's talk upstairs. Don't start, mate, because <laughs> I've been accused. I wrote a paper about 9-11 truthers, and they've been hounding me ever since. It was like eight years ago. So don't, don't even <laughs> bring that up. Right, okay. <laughs> but... Um, but the crypto anarchists. The crypto anarchists. I, I think that the crypto anarchists. These are the people that believe in that powerful in, encryption as, a, as essentially as a way of undermining governments, but any big centralized structure and empowering people. I think they are both a solution. They are a solution to one problem, and they're going to create another big problem. The solution. They may be the solution to the massive tech monopolies that we are all building between us. Um, they will be able to disrupt them. Cryptocurrencies will do that. Blockchain-based social media services, widespread use of encryption could definitely help the sort of insane advertising model that we've all bought into, data in exchange for free services. And the people that were behind crypto anarchy, fascinating philosophy really in the 90s, were way ahead of the curve. I mean, they talked about all the problems we're going through now, massive surveillance systems, huge monopolies run on data and platforms. They spotted all of that and said, we need to put powerful encryption in the hands of ordinary people. But they also, so that's great. They also said, and hopefully we'll bring down some governments as well in the meantime, because they're also centralized and bad. So let's build cryptocurrencies to stop governments taxing us, monitoring our spending, controlling the money supply. Yeah, great idea, but tax is pretty important if you are gonna run a functioning representative democracy. So the problem with the crypto anarchists is I really like what they're doing in some respects, but I think they're storing up a whole lot of other problems because all this wonderful talk about blockchain technology, it is very interesting, but you're gonna be building decentralized, distributed, ad-only led databases that can't be censored or controlled. No judge or police or jury will be able to remove stuff that's placed on them, even if it's inaccurate. And that, I think, is going to cause us a lot of trouble in running a criminal justice system that actually works. Do you, I mean, to a degree, are you a believer? There are some other solutions in the book, yeah. though. It's not all doom and gloom. There are some solutions. Well, we've got 20 minutes. So let's keep in doom and gloom since we're in the basement of, uh, <laughs> basement of Future Fest. Um, I do want to talk about Web 3.0 just a little bit further because there does seem to be problems with blockchain-based solutions, partly because blockchain is being co-opted. It does promise a certain degree of decentralization, but I just wonder, are you a believer in Web 3.0, as they want to call it? Or do you think it won't succeed insofar as we run Web 2.0 in parallel with Web 3.0? In other words, do we need a collapse of Web 2.0 for oh. Web 3.0 to emerge from the ashes? Is that the way to build it? John Perry Barlow said, look, the internet is not a construction project and governments aren't welcome here. Well, it became a construction project and governments are all over it. So perhaps what we need is actually a demolition right now. But I like governments. I want governments. <laughs> I want intermediaries. I don't want things to be smashed up. Uh -huh. So um, this is the dilemma I have with these guys. I, I, <laughs> The way I look at it is that I, I look back to the early 90s and, and the language that was used then is eerily reminiscent of the language used now by the blockchain fanatics. Mm -hmm. That we are going to build a decentralized system, there's going to be a long tail and ordinary people are going to connect together and no one's really going to be in charge and it's going to be democratizing. That was the promise of the 90s. Really genuinely believed by the people that were behind it. I don't, they weren't trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes, but it became centralized for lots of different reasons. And Bitcoin is already very, very centralized, even though it promises not to be. A small number of people own the mining rigs that mine the Bitcoin and own the Bitcoin themselves. 
The banks now are the ones that are pouring all the money and investment and financial services into cryptocurrencies. So I guess all I'm saying is I want to experiment with it, but I don't want to put all my eggs into this basket and say this is the answer because that tends not to work out too well. So in that, in that case, what do we do in the interim? Do we, do we do what we're doing right now with regards to bringing Zuckerberg in front of governments and looking at more regulation? Yes. Or do we, <laughs> or do we just turn around to Silicon Valley and go, look, you guys broke it, therefore you guys should fix it and give them a little bit more leeway just to see if they can solve the problem. Also, yes, right. we can do both of those things. I mean, we can, we, we, like, so for example, when it comes to addictive technology, the idea that our, our phones are built to be addictive, and there's been a lot of talk about this over the last couple of months, that we are slaves to the um, attention-grabbing phones that have been built to be like tobacco or alcohol. The analogy isn't quite right because I don't think a lot of them are intentionally building it to be addictive. They're basically companies that are building technology to maximize use like you do with any product. You build it to be as good as possible. The difference is they can run a million A-B split tests on tiny little modifications to their platforms to work out what makes people stay for longer. And it's all done automate or autom in an automated fashion. But it's going to be very hard to see how government's going to do anything about that. What are they going to say? Well, you can't use red notifications because red notifications are more addictive than green notifications. So everyone in Silicon Valley has to use green notifications on. It's not going to work. But the tech companies realize that this is bad for their image. The idea they're trying to build things that are addictive to kids especially is really bad for their image and maybe bad for business. So you encourage them to try and build in more ways to help people stay off their phones if they want to. I mean, what is but, the But that shouldn't be instead of also taking on the monopolies as the European Union has done, you know, bigging up the fines like the German government has done if Facebook refuses to remove hate speech. You might disagree with both of those, but I think it's important that governments are showing a bit of backbone, even if you don't think the regulations are necessarily exactly right. I mean, that, that's regulation by using the stick, but what is the carrot? What other things could potentially incentivize social media networks to actually cannibalize their own business model for the betterment of us as individuals? <laughs> or do you think we're just going to have- Regulation can be a, a, a carrot as well because I, I recently presented this Radio 4 analysis show about regulating big tech, and I interviewed Ralph Nader, who was the big uh, like car safety advocate in the 60s. And when he, he published a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, and he, was, he basically said the automobile industry did not care about safety at all. It caused this huge ruckus in 1965. Following year, a Motor Safety Act was passed with mandatory windscreens, shatterproof windscreens, seatbelts, headrests, and some other stuff. And the whole industry said that it was going to collapse. They said, we can't build this stuff. It's impossible. Engineering, it's not going to work. The US car sector is going to die on its feet. One year later, Ford and General Motors are competing with each other with adverts about who has the best seatbelts. So they suddenly have a new incentive to compete. So you're still using the market mechanism, but on something that's considered to be socially more beneficial. And I wonder whether regulation like GDPR might help that. You'll see them competing over privacy settings. And what's Facebook started doing? Running TV ads, billboard ads, newspaper ads about, we look after your data. We're going to deal with that fake news. makes me super suspicious because the whole Facebook model when they sell advertising is our advertising is more efficient on Facebook than it is on billboards, newspapers, yeah. <laughs> and, and in traditional media. I kind of believe they don't want anybody to see those adverts, which is the reason they're using traditional media to buy it. I haven't that. seen an ad on Facebook's platform for me to do any of those things they're advertising on the billboards we're supposed to be ignoring based on the fact that Facebook has sent their entire business model yeah. is based on that. Interesting point. I haven't thought of that. Uh, they may be super <laughs> suspicious, but it sounds like there is still hope at least. And on, on that note, I want to end with this reminder for those interested in the future. And that's this, that the future is always virtual. And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that in this session. Please join me in thanking the incredible Jamie Bartlett. Thanks, Dave.